It is the Bob McCown podcast. We bid you greetings and uh, salutations uh, from the big smoke. We hope you're well wherever you are. Yours truly, Bob McCown, along with John Shannon. Hello, Robert. Uh, Today, the head coach of the Winnipeg Jets. Um, I must say this. This is probably overstated, but uh, he's one of my favorite guys. Um, I got to know him when he was the head coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs. I didn't know him a a, a damn uh, before he got to the Leafs. And um, he was pretty straightforward, um, um, not overly gregarious, not particularly funny when I first met him. But then you get to know him, and um, he's just one of the most delightful guys you'd ever want to meet. Paul Maurice is going to join us in a bit. It's inter- interesting you say that. Uh, he, he's he's a soothing talker, mm-hmm. and he seems to explain the game uh, rather simply. I think he's done a remarkable job in Winnipeg, not only behind the bench, but in in talking to a passionate fan base. And uh, he's he's... He's got a really good hockey club, Bob, and they're going to be uh, they're going to be reckoned with before this season's over. Well, I can make the argument, you know, he's had some level of success every place he's been, you know, mm. um, and he's done. A, I think he's done a good job every place, um, but he's landed in Winnipeg, and uh, who knows, might be there till he finishes coaching. Well, Wouldn't you know what? He's a, you know, they they made the biggest trade of the season in getting Pierre Luc Dubois, and. Yep. Uh, He's going to be the type of guy that'll have a great opinion about uh, the firing of Claude Julian, which happened Wednesday. Uh, uh, he's a, he's a coach's coach. He's he's somebody well, that's fun to listen to. We'll talk to him in just a minute. Paul Maurice of the Winnipeg Jets when the podcast begins after this. We're back. It's the podcast, uh, the Bob McCallum podcast. Yours truly, John Shannon. And uh, with us, the head coach of the Winnipeg Jets, Paul Maurice, is uh, with us. How are you? I'm real good, guys. How are you doing? We're doing all right. Um, as we uh, as we talk here, you're about to face the uh, Montreal Canadiens with a new head coach, uh, Claude Julien, um, uh, relieved of his duties, if you will. Is there anything when you you've gone through this before? Uh, I assume. Don't remind them. <laughs> no. Well, I don't mean from a personal <laughs> standpoint. It's true, it's part of the job, right? So I've, it's happened to me three times, and I bet you, I honestly, Bob, I went on a long run of getting coaches fired because if you lost to the Hartford Whalers or you lost to <laughs> Carolina, and those, I, 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 I'm not joking. I think I got Mike Keenan fired four times. I think. <laughs> But I, for sure, I think I think we won Jersey the Stanley Cup though because we beat them five nothing in New Jersey, like with eight games left to go in the season. And Larry, they fired the coach, and Larry took over, and they won the Stanley Cup. That they year. did yeah. indeed, yeah. 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 indeed. Uh, we've yeah, been look, a part of that. You look at it this way, Paul. You, you got Mike Keenan that job in Magnitogorsk. There you go, and he won there. <laughs> he won the championship there. Yeah, the Gagarin Cup. Yeah, yeah, perfect. whatever that means. Anyway, I cut you off, Bob. I'm sorry. No, I, well, I'm intrigued by, like, you're preparing for the Montreal Canadiens. Right. Is there anything that, you know, with a new coach coming in first game, is there anything you can do? Is there anything you tell your players, you know, to be aware of? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's nearly impossible to change anything major in your game from their point of view, except – the percentage of the game that's about emotion, that's about focus, intensity, the pressure coming off their team. And that can be huge. Now, we, we're not, you know, privileged to know what's going on in the room, but every time you, you there's a coaching change, there is an absolute emotional bump. So how much of that was the reason for the way they were playing? We're going to find out, I guess, that tomorrow night, right, if it's just an emotional thing. But I don't think system I, – I, Claude's teams are always very systemized, right? They, they're mm-hmm. really uh, consistent with that part of the game. I don't think any of that changes, but it takes a long time to change a major system. You can change how you regroup the puck a little bit, change your focuses, but it, it, you know what truly will be interesting, and this is kind of a Petri dish coaching change in some ways because there's going to be no practice time. 
So you're going to make your changes right. based on individual conversations and video meetings and how you run the bench, but you're not really going to take, uh, be able to take them out in the ice and work them for two or three days to get some new drills in. Because I do think, I do think how you practice your team, I think that is, separates a lot of coaches. If you get a team to practice fast, if their hands are good, like I always thought Montreal passed the puck exceptionally well. They always seem very, very quick. I thought they practiced well. But you look at our schedule right now. We got Montreal tomorrow. I've got two full practices, I think, coming up. One is going to be on March 8th, and the next one is going to be on April 19th. And I'm not joking. <laughs> but other, it, but, other than that, it's an off day or we're playing. But it, but now, in fairness, uh, we're taping this on a Wednesday afternoon. You haven't played till Sunday, since Sunday. Correct. You, you And you probably had a mandatory, mandatory day off on Monday. Right. Yeah. So you had a practice yesterday. Yeah. So, and here's the, the little story on our season. We've had, this is our fourth block. Uh, we've lost all three games coming off a block of time. So three days, three days, and four days, we've lost each one of them. Two, two, we didn't like, we liked our third one in Calgary. So rhythm is so important to these guys. If they get feeling good, they want to get on the ice. But in terms of when you're a new coach taking over, I think a lot of the changes um, happen on the ice in practice because it's the one place you're constantly talking to the players. Well, now you can't even talk to the players, right? You got to stay 15 feet away from them with a mask on. So it's a real challenge for them. I, I think being able to implement a lot of changes in the environment that we're in right now is going to be difficult. Now, I probably should know this, but um, of the um, occasions that you have taken over teams, right? I can't remember. Did you? T how many teams have you taken over, if any, during the season? Uh, two during the season, uh, one, two, yeah, twice during the season, twice. I, I guess that's not true. My first year was during the season too. So, oh, okay. Uh, my my first year kind of middling results, and it wasn't till January that we got we had a winning month in January. It was the first winning month the franchise it has in four years. So that you got to think about how hard that is to do to lose for four months a year. Okay, so that's how bad we were. Um, Carolina. You know, kind of, we did it. It took a while before we got going. When I came into here, we got going right away. Um, yeah. But that schedule too, you know, we had a decent schedule coming into me coming in and, and we had some practice time. So we were able to change some things. The point here, uh, Paul, is uh, when you know a guy, when you know him on a personal yeah. level, when you understand his game, his abilities, when you've been working with him for a period of time, I'm sure it's easy to lean over um, on the bench and throw five words in his ear Right. And you get his attention. He knows exactly what you're talking about. This in a first game, right? What do you say anything to a player? I, can you even have any kind Absolutely. of dialogue with him? You know, you're doing small corrections. But when I got here, it was a busy, busy day. So I was in. I truly was introducing myself to the guys on a few guys on the bench who I hadn't got around to saying hello. So Eric Odell was one of them. I think he scored the game winner that night. But. <laughs> There's more. This job is is yeah. The the small conversations, the interpersonal relationships are probably the grease that keeps everything running. They're critically important in this game. But in terms of being able to change, he'll be able to change the emotional energy of that team tomorrow. It goes right from hey, it's not my fault anymore to let's go for hey, let you know if you're always if even if you're not getting fired, you're always looking for that ability to cut the last game off, cut the negative off, and move on to the positive to, so you can get on another roll going forward. When you can't do that anymore, when you can't get out of the negative, when you can't get that thing just even slightly turned and they put a new coach in and that's done immediately, right? We've got a new direction now. Everybody keeps a deep breath and away we go. There's a dominant team at the start of the year. They struggled a little bit. We're going to expect them to be as good as they were at the start, to, you know, when we play them. How much do you rely on uh, veteran leadership to get some of the message off to the, uh, out to the team? I would wait on that. I think, I think you wait. I think when you will first walk into a room, you don't want five messages. You only want one, right? Okay. I'm the new guy. This is the way we're doing. And, and I think the veteran guys are going to listen. They'll listen. They'll do it. And, and, but they're also assessing, okay, who is this new guy? But I think when you first walk into a room, there's not a lot of messages. There's only one. You're the guy, you're the guy driving that bus. And it's, that's probably true in every room. And then that works for a while. And then eventually they take the keys from you. Uh this is a challenging year by uh, by all standards. Um, what's what specific challenges are there in playing a team as repetitively uh, repetitively 
as you guys are right now, given the COVID situation, what nine games against everybody uh, and back to backs and 10 all against some stuff. Bob. Right. Ten against some. Ten against some. Oh, yeah. I don't. I don't feel there's anything different in these three or four game blocks of teams. Um, it's no. It's a version of the playoffs, right? Whether you're a four or seven game series. So that part of it, that prep part, is actually easier and more fun. You get to focus on one team. You don't have to move around your pre scouts. All the coaches are in on it. So that part I like. There is a. Uh, I mean, it is, it's the same teams over and over again. That gets a little bit boring. It's, it's the truth, right? Like it's just, yep. you like the, and, and as a coach, you want to see the other great players. I don't, I don't want to coach against Sidney Crosby. I want to go in and play against Tampa because they won last year. And then there's, so the, the games for us against Nashville and St. Louis, which are our most heated rivalries, they come up, you see those coming from three weeks away, right? So you get really excited about them. So I don't think I mean, players are no different than fans and coaches. We like that something new, exciting coming down the pipe. The things I've been a real fan of are staying in the same city for two games on the road. I mean, just for the wear and tear on the players, that's great. We're not getting off the plane at two o'clock in the morning. That's a real, real positive. Uh, but just started to lately kind of pick up, you know, we got Montreal twice and then it's Van again and then Montreal again. And then you start to get a little bit, you know, could you throw a New York Rangers in there every once in a while, just change things up a little, be nice. Actually, it just occurred to me that, that your team is in a different boat than all the other Canadian teams, because you're in, in the previous years, you're the only Canadian team in your division. You know, you go, you go North South. So this has been a little bit of a change for you when you play Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, and then Ottawa, right. Montreal, Toronto so much more. Right. And, and for the most part, you're exactly right. Like the East is a whole different world, right? We play them twice, but it, for us a lot, of the West is too, right? We play them three times a year instead of twice a year. We're all central focused. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of out of our element completely. We've got Vancouver's got the same problem that we do. We're the, we're the only two teams that, play every road game outside our time zone. So there's some challenges, some weirdness about the geography to this for sure. But yeah, we, we've kind of picked up, you know, seven new opponents, six, seven teams that we don't see very much. Uh, one of the situations that happened recently, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but uh, St. Louis and Arizona played seven consecutive games against seven the straight. Yep. Um, I mean, we're never going to see that again. I, I hope. Um, and, and there's a, there's a sense, Paul, that, because it's seven, I guess, that somehow this is going to parallel a seven-game playoff series, that somehow uh, the anxiety of the the feistiness will build, and by, by the time you get to game seven, anything could happen. But really didn't, did it? No, and I don't think that – I, I don't – it's it, – it's seven games no matter what, right? You win the first four, you still got to play the last three. So the right. there you go. doesn't build as this thing stacks. And I think what you'll find with, uh, if you get into a, a five game series or a four game series, they're going to be flash points where you're getting fights and scrums, right? The things just absolutely blow up. But then I think it just levels flat out and it's kind of here we go again. Okay, we don't want this stupidity to run four more games so it gets, also gets very quiet in some of those games where you expect them possibly to be really really physical but something will blow up and uh around the net front and it'll get real nasty for a little bit but it, it, it's not it's not the same thing it can't be the same thing how, how do you manage the road uh, i've talked to a couple of coaches and a couple of managers saying that it's really hard on the players and i and i rolled my eyes at them and they said no 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 they're serious when you think that a player, when he's on the road, can only go to his hotel room, he can only go to the rink and maybe the player's lounge, and you're in the same town for three or four days, right. that, 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 that's a bit of a sacrifice. Yeah. So I try not to get too – I'm lucky. You know, I mean, we all have home lives. This, this COVID has been a challenge. It's been a year now. Like we're March 11th last year, we got shut down. And you start to appreciate – I want to be I want to be respectful how I say this because I'm this hotel that we're locked in is a really nice hotel right so it's not that bad but boy you spend a lot more time alone than you used to and that can't be a good thing especially I'm not a particularly social person but I know a bunch of people are and so we, we had this exact event right we go into van 
and I've got a day off scheduled on the road. So my reaction to my last trip was I'm pulling as many days off on the road as I can. I'm just going to jam them in at home and let them at least be at home when they're, because you're right. Like you can go for a walk, you know, you're not supposed to get a coffee and you're not supposed to, you can go for a walk, but that's it. Like you, you're pretty much isolated the entire time. And these are active young people, right? They're used to doing stuff, even if that's just going down to the rink. So if you bring them down to the rink during the regular season, they would complain that you're always bringing us down to the rink. Now these guys are dying to get to the rink, right? So we had an off day here and uh, Scheif had a, Mark Scheif had a hockey school. So he, he texted a bunch of the guys, he gets the ice here. He says, I'm going out, coaches, you know, can't go. It's a pure off day. And he's got eight or nine guys out there just passing the puck around because they got nothing else to do. So. Right. I, I think about, I was thinking about that for people maybe who aren't in the structure of their life that we have so many people around us, that this is a very difficult, the loneliness is a very difficult thing. And, I, and we felt that on the road. And they, I mean, the young guys can't even play video games really against each other in their hotel rooms. I mean, because you you're, and you're, by the way, your, your team is rather famous for video games. So. You're, you're, you're at the mercy of the, the internet speed at your hotel, right? These guys would <laughs> sleep in a motel if they got the right internet speed. <laughs> Let's get our priorities set. <laughs> well, that's interesting you guys talking about that because i was just going to bring that up so for 20 something year olds in this era yeah. video games consume oh. your time and your and your life in general um what what do you do when you're sitting around the hotel room so the interesting part is that um nothing much changes for coaches then, right? Like at the end of the day, whether you're sitting in your office at the rink of your hotel, there's a big chunk of video that you got to watch. So post game, um, if you don't do it on the plane, it takes me about three and a half hours to get through our game, get it eight, and then you got to get a meeting together. And then you've got your pre-scouts lined up for the next night. So that's two or three hours and then you have dinner. So, and then there's games on. The one nice part about being on the West Coast is you're watching hockey from four o'clock on. So your day gets consumed by the same things. It's just in a different place. Okay. But players don't do any of that, right? So they've got so much more time to just kind of, I, I mean, I, I don't know what they would do on that extra time, but we, we, we talked about that, the, the length of our road trips is considerably longer and today I just went through with my team services guy and we pulled our road days, our off days on the road, we pulled them out so that we could put them at home. Like like after this homestand, I think you're on the road. It yeah. looks like the whole month of March almost. Well, we're going to leave March 3rd. We come back for two games uh, and we get back off the road March 30th. Wow. Yeah. Cool. We played 17 games. 17 games this month, uh, the month of March. That'll be the most games we've ever played in a month. Uh, your organization made uh, almost inarguably uh, the biggest trade um, of the last uh, while, and uh, we want to address that and how it's gone and uh, the thought process behind it. We'll do that when we come back, and the podcast uh, continues in a moment. The head coach of the Winnipeg Jets, Paul Maurice, is uh, with us. Yours truly, uh, Bob McCowan, John Shannon here. Uh, the Dubois trade uh, was not a shock. Uh, but it certainly is an a, a, a big trade, an impactful trade uh, to very high profile and um, prolific guys involved in the deal. This is not your responsibility. You're the head coach, not the general manager. But I assume that you are consulted on these kinds of things or at least made aware of conversations that are taking place. Yes? No? You're sure you're aware of all of it. Um and something like this doesn't sneak up over the course of a weekend, right? It's something that's on the horizon. A lot of thought goes into it. So the, the way I always looked at it is the structure of this. Both of these young men um, are going to be franchise players, and they're going to command a really large chunk of the resources of that franchise. So in order for that to work for everybody, it has to fit. You have the pieces have to fit. And in our case, we were going to get to a point, Patty's going to score. Man, this guy's as brilliant a shooter as I've ever seen him. I don't know, like somewhere between 40 and 60 goals for the next 10 years. Mm. And, and he's going to play on the wing and that's, that's fine. And then we have this structure of Cal Connor, Nikolai Ehlers, Blake Wheeler here now, some really high end wingers. Um, and in a perfect world, after losing Brian Little, it would have been a centerman that would have fit our, our, group. right. And, the structure 
in, in Columbus, that's another thought. But if you're going to commit to this, then you want to know that guy's going to be there for a very, very long time. Um, and we didn't know the answer to that question. We also, but we did know, I think we knew that he was going to be really, really expensive, right? This is going to be a big piece. So maybe it's just a little bit of fate. Both organizations had this problem they couldn't necessarily solve internally and, and found a way to solve, solve it by switching. My understanding is they're real happy and why wouldn't they be? Patty's going to score. We're really happy with Pierre-Luc. He, he looks exactly and maybe more than what we thought we were going to get. So it just, it just fit. And I think both organizations were pretty darn lucky to find that fit that easily. Now, you, you, you've got him on the wing right now. He was impressive in Vancouver on Sunday. Uh, I assume uh, Thursday night he'll stay on the wing for now with Wheeler and Shafley, but, but he's a centerman. Correct. And, and, and we want to develop him as a centerman, and that's where he's going. So what happened was um, I've got a bunch of centermen here now. I'm bringing the guy in off injury. He's new to the systems. He really has been off for a month, so I really wasn't expecting true. And I said this before, I'm not expecting anything from him tonight after everything he's been through. But you knew just by watching him that it'd be interesting to watch him play with Shaif and Wheeler. Like, mm -hmm. there's something there. And they went through three offensive zone shifts in the first, first period and going, oh, my God, this could be good, right? At the same, so I'm just going to run it until it's not. So I, I didn't have to ask anybody to make a sacrifice. Pierre Luc was fine going to the wing. He knows how that we feel he's a center iceman. I got Stastny in the middle between Kyle Connor and Nikolai Ehlers. We like that line too. We can flip those two guys, uh, Stastny and Dubois, at any point in time. But I think that everybody on the ice had fun with the way it looked. Uh, so I'll leave it until we stop having fun with it. Are you the? Are you? Do you think you're the biggest team in the league? I thought we were. So there was a stretch in time, and then in one summer, we became real small, real fast, right? We lost about 2,000, 1,000 pounds wow. worth of defensemen in about three <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Ben Sherratt, Tyler Myers, Jake Truba, and Dustin Buffum. Dustin Buffum, sure. So we lost a big chunk of our size. What's interesting is Pierre-Luc's a big man. Um, we're bringing Derek Forbert, and then... Logan Stanley kind of at six, nine or eight or whatever he is, came out of the blue and he's a big man. So we, we got, we got back to being a little bit bigger pretty quick. I just like, I, I love your size up front, yeah. particularly when you get Dubois at center. Right. Holy smokes. You guys, you're, you're like the four horse of the horsemen of the apocalypse. Right. We've got, and, and Adam Lowry's just had a real good start to a season bigger and stronger than he's ever been. I mean, that's the, the strength of our team kind of down the middle is, is where we're, we should be real good. I mean, we've played one game. Well, have, well we haven't played a game with it yet, really. And uh, we'll get to it fairly soon. Before Bob jumps in, I got one. <laughs> now that you got Dave on the, on the, uh, the coaching staff yeah. and you got Adam playing, th th does Adam ever turn around and say, dad, shut up? Yeah. <laughs> No, no, we're good there. Um, <laughs> you know what? It's interesting because I talked to Dave about coming on four years ago before I hired Jamie Compon, and it didn't fit except the coach did. You know, I wanted to hire the coach, but the relationship didn't fit. And then I called Adam first uh, because when, when our guy left, uh, Todd Woodcroft left for the University of Vermont, and he, he was quick with it, right? It's not a problem if it works for you and the coaching staff, I don't have an issue and it's been great. Dave's been a fantastic addition to our staff and there hasn't, other than the occasional Joe, big dad and little dad and things like that. Uh, it's been good. Um, this, uh, this question is not necessarily appropriate, but you, you guys were talking about uh, how big your team is uh, size wise. Do you coach differently dependent upon size i mean you do to some extent with skill set i know you have to do that but if a team is particularly f big and capable of playing physical hockey right does it change your approach paul sure sure i mean and you know what and it's i would have if you if we were doing this a day earlier i would have said the montreal Canadiens are, are a perfect example of that because for the last few years they've been kind of undersized and small mm -hmm. but man do they play quick right they, they don't of course play checks but they get on the puck they don't hang on to the puck a lot in the offensive zone but they get a phenomenal number of slot shots so they, they would have one of the lowest offensive zone 
puck control teams in the league, but they are number one in what we call adjusted shots. That's slot shots, inner and outer slot shots, the number one team in the league. So they find a way at a smaller size to get pucks to the net. Now, they've started to add size back into the lineup on their blue line, and of course, Anderson up front, and you see them then finishing more checks, right? So you, you are using what you can. We got a bigger team up front. So even going back three or four years ago, we would have been in the top two or three teams in the NHL for offensive puck control because we like to hang on to it. So it would almost be in some ways the opposite of Montreal. They'll shoot everything from the outside and attack the net. It's a timing thing, right? They're always driving the net and we would hang on to the puck one-on-one, -on -one, take a guy one-on-one -on -one and try to open something up and then go to the net with our size. So you for sure approach what you can get away with based on whatever your assets are. If you're a real fast team, if you're a real big team, you try to employ that. How much would you change your coaching philosophy line to line, given that there are size differentials, strategic uh, um, uh, skill differentials from line to line? Well, it's, it's, the, the job has to get done either way, but that's a great question. And if you look at our three lines, it's kind of answered in that. Dubois is a big man, Scheiff's a big man, and Wheeler is, but they can all skate and they can all handle the puck. They're going to look completely differently than Ehlers, Stastny, and Kyle Connor, mm -hmm. right? Not a, not a heavy line at all. Two guys can absolutely fly. So a specific would be this. You dump a puck in the corner and you're going to go get it. And three, you got three different guys. Shife's going to go in and lift the stick a little bit, and then he's going to put his body in front of you, so he's going to shield it. Uh, Kyle Connor is going to lift your stick and get out of there before you can get to him, and Adam Lowry's going to blow you up and then take the puck. So all, all three, but the end result has to be the same. So I don't yell at Nick Ehlers ever to play like Adam Lowry, right? right. They're, they're, they, we have to get the job has to get done. It has to get done uh, in the end, but how you do it is completely you know, how you. What your skill set allows you to pull off. Actually, Nick Gaylers has become a an interesting guy for you in that uh, it appears through the first part of this season, if you had a troubled guy, you stick him with Ehlers and things turn around. Ehlers has been really good. So what's funny, I, I, this whole analytics thing is is an, is interesting to me. I've been really interested, not in the math part of it, but um, Nikolai Ehlers is an analytics star, right? And that's true. Whoever I put him with, um, their five-on-five five possession or basically how many pucks they get to that versus how many pucks they give up. His numbers are spectacular. Part of that, though, is if I'm playing Nicky with you, I'm probably not running you against the other team's best. I'm looking for an advantage, right? I'm not, I'm not going to – I might. But I'm not looking to play Nicky uh, against Austin Matthews or, or McDavid. I'll try to find another place for him to play. So you're right, though. His, his numbers – and wherever I needed the line to get a jump, they go with Nicky because he gets going. So if you just take it to the kind of the subconscious part of a hockey player's brain, if they're out there and they're getting chances, right? You've heard that thought, hey, I'm, I'm not scoring, but I'm getting my chances. Well, if you play with Nicky, you get some chances, whether it's him or something. He, he just generates offense. So you start to feel better about yourself. And all of a sudden you got a line going. Um, I looked at your, your team stats and I don't have them in front of me, so you'll forgive me if I'm a little bit off on this, but I saw a lot of middle, upper middle of the pack. Not middle of the pack, but ninth, 10th, 11th uh, power play goals, you know, uh, uh, penalty kill, uh, goaltending in general, all, all those stats. How do you feel about that? It, it, I mean, you'd like to be 1-1-1 one, one, one right across the board, of course. You know but, what? I'm really good with it. So... If you take a deeper look into those kind of statistics across the board, um, if you if you look at the Stanley Cup champions over the last ten years, and you were to find rank them relative to the rest of the league in all the important categories, the one thing that would be fairly consistent is they're pretty darn good defensively. And I mean, I'm talking about Tampa or all of those, you know, we look at these high end goal scoring teams. It's actually that defensive number might be, and then you can go deeper in the analytics, but let's just do it as goals against. Okay. So with the way our team is built with the, you know, we're kind of a younger, we were younger offensively skewed forwards. We still have offensively skewed forwards and kind of a, more of a no-name defense. We lost, you know, 60% of a real powerful blue line. We finished in 10th in goals against last year before right. the season was paused. Um, kind of proud of that. Like, I think Charlie Huddy did a phenomenal job getting that number. Now, we got a great goaltender. 
we got two great goaltenders right now. And we're sitting, I think, eighth in goals against in the North Division. Uh, um, the rest of those stats don't excite me or, or bother me one way or the other. Where you sit goals against matters. We went from fifth in the NHL the year we had 114 points and we dropped to 17th. And that for me is attitude more than anything else. I mean, yeah, that's with all those big defensemen that we had. Now we got ourselves back up to 10th. We're sitting eighth now. That's the number that I, that I take some pride in or I, I get growly when it starts to slip. What you, you talked about two great goalies. What's your ratio? How many times are we going to see Brossois the rest of the way? Well, I, I'd like three, three out of four for Helly is what I'd like to do. You know, 75% of the take, well, he'll have, we've got three sets of back-to-backs in this crazy month of March. I'm looking at my calendar when I'm answering this question. But, yeah. Uh, LB would take all three of those and then I'll find them if I can one to two more. He's really grown, hasn't he? You know what? Every year since we had him, he'd come into camp wired and phenomenal out of the gate and then eventually connor's schedule i think affected him not not he's not lazy this guy works at it i think that this he's going to have a phenomenal year this year and it's going to be because of this condensed schedule where i have to play him more where he actually gets to stay in a rhythm and show what he can do and then i think we're going to have to really fight hard to pay him for next year because somebody's going to want him <laughs> Uh, anything else, John? Before uh... well, I just uh, you know the the interesting thing is we've we've you've mentioned Mark Shifley's name in almost in passing, Paul, and yet uh, if you were to talk about the most valuable players to teams across the league, yeah. you might have to put Mark Shifley in the Hart Trophy can, uh, conversation right now. I, I I'm a I'm a as you know I'm an Ehlers fan. I think Mark, uh, Nick Ehlers is spectacular. But I've watched your team the last couple of games, and my, oh, my, yeah. Mark Shifley is spectacular. What happened to Mark is, so I'll give you two examples. He goes into the uh, seven-game series that we play against the Nashville Predators a few years ago, and he sets a National Hockey League record for road goals in a series, and that's the best hockey I've ever seen him play because – he is fantastic offensively, and he's and he's getting better, right? Like his hands, believe it or not, his hands are getting better. The things he can do with the puck. But this year, he made a concerted effort to be a grinder in his own end. And when he does that, I take him over anybody. Like when he's he's a big, strong kid. He's a big, strong young man. And when he puts that kind of grind, and we're starting to see, and that's all maturity, right? Right. When those guys get a little older, I can't. We can't win if I'm the number one center and I'm not competing in my own end. He's starting to do that. Lo and behold, he's also creeping up the scoring list. So, big fan. Yeah, and the, the, the other thing is you and I exchanged in Texas a few weeks back after you publicly came out and defended your captain, Blake Wheeler. Um, it, there are lots of reasons to do that. Um, but in the end, it, it has to be assuring for him that you have his back. So, I would hope so. I, I would think so. I think the players know that I don't lie to them and I, and I don't lie to the media. And there's a bunch of stuff I don't tell people, but, right. but I'm, I'm real honest. I, I've never seen a guy, and I've had some really, really good ones, right? Like, you think about captains I've had, Ron Francis, uh, Matt Sundin, some like high-end Hall of Fame guys. This guy is right there in terms of his every day, what's best for the Winnipeg Jets. And, and the story's not out there here. It's not, and and that and it makes me angry because I've seen them play with broken bones over and over again, and no, and what, what am I going to go and tell you that before? Hey, listen, the guy, you know, he played with a broken heel last year, couldn't walk, but he's on the ice doing everything. So as a coach, you're kind of going, that's all you could ever ask, and he's taken some heat for his play, and he had like 11 points in 10 games. Mm -hmm. So I was angry at all parts of it, and it was a plus minus stat or some bullshit. I don't know, Corsi stat or something. And I just, right? like, <laughs> I've seen this guy play with everything. He's had two weekends where his plus minus got lit up. And the one that he was getting killed for, it was absolutely not his fault, right? The other guy on his line just pooched him and, and he got killed. So I, I was at, I was just at that day and it was, I was lucky because if they'd caught me five minutes earlier, it had been just one long beep, you know? Yeah. It was just, anyway, I got off the, I'll, I'll last, last one from me. Um, 
you will play an entire season not seeing three quarters of the uh, other teams in the National Hockey League. Right. And the dilemma that I guess we all face, well, those of us on the outside at the very least, is how does one measure an individual team when there's no barometer by which to judge? Um, tell me what you think of the other, what are there, six teams in the Canadian division are you in a good division are you in what do you think yeah so i think that's a really really good point and i wouldn't write too many heavy articles about anybody in this league being that good yet because you just don't know no. and, uh, truly like so this so i think i think ottawa is quite a bit better than people give credit for because i don't think they're very far off where we were about a year or two before we had 114 points. Heck, they beat you. They yeah, beat well, you. They're going to beat everybody. Yeah. And, and they beat us, but better yet, in the games, other well, we beat them 5 nothing one night. But other than those other games, it was just like their last game. It's a scratch and claw. It's a better team than you think. After that, so I was just telling Chevy this. Over 82 games, you'll go in some nights, you're feeling good, your team's feeling good, you know your opponent, you're a little stronger than them. It's not about arrogance. You know where you're at, you're going to beat them that night. And, and you can feel it. And I haven't had that feeling yet going into a game this year. Walking in, okay, I think mm. we're feeling good. Uh, we're playing Calgary. We're playing Ebon. There's nothing for you to feel good about. I, and so I'm I'm completely off this media. Like, let's kill the Vancouver Canucks because they're terrible. Every game that we you know, they beat the heck out of us the first time we played them. And we had to scratch and claw to beat them. I find that walking off the bench every single night. There's no easy night. I also know when I turn on and I watch Colorado and Vegas go toe to toe, or I watch Florida and Tampa go head to head, or you watch Boston and Washington go on, I'm probably disrespecting, you know, another really, really good team. There's some big boys out there, yeah. right? We, we don't have truly, I don't, we don't have the bottom end of a division, whether we have a true top end of a division that we don't know yet. Right. Find out in the uh, Stanley cup semifinal and not a moment before. Right? Okay. Okay, you, you always tell us, Paul, that you like to tell the truth, and uh, this this one's totally off the board. Good. A year from now, we're supposed to be in Beijing with the Olympics. Do you want to be on that coaching staff? Oh God, yeah. For the Chinese team. <laughs> how, about, <laughs> how, 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 about, how about the team in red? Oh yeah, come on. That's that's the. Uh, the thing that you cherish more as you get older are all the unique experiences. One of the best in my last five years has been that World Cup with right. Ralph. It was just, it made me a better coach, like miles better. I thought it really improved me. But anybody that gets a chance to be on that staff, for sure, you'd love to. Well, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if that day comes. And uh, we uh, we hope it does for uh, your sake. Um, you've always been good to us. We really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. We thank you very much. We wish you uh, continued success. Team's playing okay. Um, upwardly mobile, and uh, we'll see how the uh, the rest of the season unfolds. Thank you, great, Coach. Great, uh, great to see you. It's been a while, Bob. Great to see you again. Uh, we'll talk soon, John. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we get to see you face-to-face in, uh, -face right. in the not-too-distant future. All right. Take care, guys. The head coach of the Winnipeg Jets, Paul Maurice. That's it for the podcast. For John, it's Bob. Bye-bye.